So here's my view. My job as U.S. president is to look after the interests of Americans here in the homeland. I don't think that should be controversial, but that's my view. I think the job of Israel's president is to look after the citizens of Israel. And I think that we're an ally of Israel. And what do we do as an ally of Israel? I think it is to provide diplomatic support without military intervention. And so all of this stuff about sending this kind of aid or that, I think it's better for Israel and better for the United States if we mind our affairs and they mind theirs, but we give them the diplomatic support they need to say, you get to do whatever you need to to defend your homeland. I think that's what I said in the stage. I mean, you, I would if I was on the phone with Bibi, I'd tell him, you know what? If you need to smoke the terrorists at your southern border that are invading and threatening your country, you go do that. And I'm going to be smoking the terrorists that are trying to smoke this country on our southern border if they're entering here and attacking our country in the same way that they're attacking yours. That's what I'm going to do. You do you. And we'll give you the diplomatic support without the U.N. or anybody else second-guessing your decisions and micromanaging you or us micromanaging you. And I think that's part of the where we muddy the waters is when – We give them some kind of check, but then we have to then become the backseat driver, the armchair quarterback, and then also have to assume and bear implicit responsibility for what does or doesn't happen. I don't think that's good for the U.S., and I don't think that's good for Israel. And actually, you know, I want people to understand this. The founding vision of Israel, the the George Washington figure in Israel was a guy by the name of David Ben-Gurion. He was the founder of Israel. The whole premise in the founding of Israel He said basically words to this effect. He was an eloquent man, about five feet tall, but a big man, a mighty man, who said, we don't want to depend on the sympathies of the West or anybody else or the United States or anybody else. I want a country where we will defend our own existence without depending on anybody else to do it. That was the premise of Israel. So I think that this whole idea, now as U.S. president, I think it's totally messed up that we're giving foreign aid to any country whose national debt per capita is less than ours. But from an even Israel perspective, that was the founding vision of Israel itself. So my view on here's what I would do is let Israel do whatever Israel needs to do to defend itself. My job as the U.S. is to look after American interests. We'll give them diplomatic support to be able to do that. But don't intervene militarily. And that makes it clear to Iran. So I can say publicly to Iran, you stay the hell out and we'll stay out. And we'll let the IDF get its job done. In the meantime, because you read some of those headlines, if you hit us, the United States of America, if you hit our sons and daughters on military bases, our troops who are serving this country, if you actually hit them, we will hit you, whoever that is, whichever group that is, we will hit that group back, the person who actually hit us, 10 times harder. This is against the backdrop of my view that we shouldn't be in places like Syria and Iraq in the first place. We were told we left Syria and Iraq. Now we find out we've got, what, thousand couple thousand people in places that we were told that we were left sitting there as sitting ducks and targets to get hit. So that shouldn't have been there in the first place, but I'm always pro-American here. If you hit us, we will hit you back. But what's interesting is there's also an interesting story. I don't know when Trump gave the speech, it was in Texas recently, I want to say, where he recounted, I think, an interesting story that went underreported. You guys could probably find it and pull it up at some point. Um, it was interesting where he told the story of after they took out Soleimani, the Iranians gave him a message or gave the you know White House a message that, hey, listen, we have to have pride here. We're going to hit back, but we're not actually going to hit you. We're going to send some missiles, but it's not going to hit anything. And that's exactly what happened. These are like very precise missiles they send up and then they ex- explode in the air without hitting their actual targets, when in fact these are very reliable, precise missiles. So in a certain sense, and that was interesting, it was fascinating. He hadn't told that story before. I hadn't, I mean, I think certainly the government hadn't told that story before. And so it's interesting where the responsible job of a U.S. president is to advance our interests, to be strong, to protect Americans. But it's not in our national interest to automatically sleepwalk our way into World War III. So for the people who are saying that because... Iran funds, you know, Hamas or Hezbollah or the Houthis or other groups. And those groups hit Israel that that gives the U.S. a reason, like the Lindsey Grahams of the world that make this argument, to preemptively strike Iran. Think about that logic. According to that logic of proxy warfare, Russia would have the right to hit the United States now because we're funding Ukraine to hit Russia. 
So those messed up theories of proxy war, that's how you get to World War III. And I think it is a vital national interest. So we have this, we have this thing I rolled out the night before the debate. It's our no to neocons pledge. Actually, people should go there. We're not asking for money or anything else. Just sign the pledge if you're on board. No to neocons.com. Okay. And every person who is a political appointee in my administration will have to sign it. Yeah, there's this. There's the no to neocons pledge. No to neocons.com. You go there. Look, just scroll down. This is not controversial stuff. If you scroll down to the three elements of this pledge, avoiding World War III is a vital national objective. I, I mean, maybe Nikki Haley agrees with me on that, disagrees with me on that, but I think most people agree with me on that. <laughs> war is never a preference, only a necessity. Well, for those for whom war is a preference, you know, from Karl Rove to, you know, John Bolton sure. to yeah. Lindsey Graham to Nikki Haley, they will disagree on that. War is never a preference, only a necessity. Okay, that's number two. Number three is the sole duty of U.S. policymakers is to U.S. citizens. So again, these things should not be controversial, but I will require any political appointee in my administration to make sure they're aligned with these three elements of a basic foreign policy vision. But that's that's what puts me at odds how with close most of the Republican Party. Vivek, today. how close are we? I think, know, you, you, I think we're closer than we've ever been in our lifetime, Patrick. 